that um, I taught medical anthropology in the department of anthropology where I taught almost for you know 25 years or so before that I taught at Hindu college. I taught medical anthropology from 1993 to 2002 and this time, you know, I really developed a lot of uh, lot of involvement in medical anthropology, and I wrote a couple of papers on on this also. But for the last so many years, you know, I have been out of touch because mainly I have been working on anthropological theory, anthropological methods, and also a comparative religion. So I've been out of touch from medical anthropology. But this time, when Dr. Reddy gave me the opportunity, and I'm really, you know, grateful to grateful to her. When she gave me this uh, this opportunity, this opportunity to to speak uh, to all of you on an aspect of medical anthropology, I avidly seized this opportunity, and I thought this will also give me some kind of a some kind of uh, you know. Uh, will give me an opportunity to look into my own understanding of medical anthropology. Now, when I started, and I want to introduce uh, this aspect because, uh, because eventually this will all bear on the discipline on the subject and the met methodology the subject has. You know, medical anthropology, I found it to be one of the most important disciplines which helps us in understanding human behavior. And unfortunately, what has happened in medical anthropology, much of medical anthropology in our country is that medical anthropology has come to be equated almost with the ethno-medical profiles, collecting ethno-medical profiles, looking at the traditional medicine and the, and the modern medicine. And the structural aspects of medical anthropology, the way in which it can contribute to the understanding of, uh, of society. Now, this part was left behind. And so when this opportunity came, I thought that I'll speak to you about, uh, about these basic concepts which come in medical anthropology, sickness, illness, and, and disease. And I will also look at the anthropology of body in this connection. Now, there are two submissions I would like to make right in the, in, in, in the beginning. The first aspect is that uh, that medical anthropology has not paid much attention to the matters of the body, the anthropology of the body. I remember some years ago, I delivered a lecture in, um, in Raipur where I, where I focused upon this point that it is very important that uh, we look at body. And so the whole question comes here is, and this is my first submission, who is an individual? What is an individual? Is individual a category which cannot be divided? Is individual a category which is indivisible? What is an individual? What does individual consist of? And how we are going to look at the, at the individual, at the individual in the context of medical, medical anthropology. This is the first thing which comes. And second is that, that in medical anthropology, in all kinds of medical studies, it is the individual who occupies the primary, primary place. Because after all, discomfort or pain emerges in the body of the individual. And here, here one would like to look at the individual as consisting of the individual as consisting of a body and then there is something else body plus something else and that something else is the domain of culture which comes with the result that body comes to be understood body comes to be understood in social and cultural 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 term now these are as you know these are very difficult time and we already know that the deadly virus, you know, I was checking the figures this morning, that deadly virus has already affected more than 43 lakh people and almost uh, 2 lakh 92 thousand people have already, already uh, you know, died because of, uh, because of this. 
Now, these are the moments where, where and I'm instantly reminded of uh, Michael Yenger, who wrote a book on religion many years ago. I read it when I was in my master's, where he says that human beings not only live through the crisis, human beings not only face the crisis, human beings being rational, they reflect upon the crisis. They want to find out why it happened. In other words, when the crisis is happening, it is not only that the human beings are grappling with them, human beings are taking stock of them and trying to solve the problem. Human beings are also trying to understand it, especially the causative aspect, the processual aspect, why did it happen? How does it happen? How to bring it under control? These are the questions which are, which are bound to come. And often what happens is, is that when the crises are in an infantile state, when the crises are in an embryonic state, we take note of it, but we do not reflect upon this with the same kind of commitment with the same kind of enthusiasm, with the same kind of academic thing as we do when the crisis have become really, you know, difficult to difficult to handle. You know, I I remember because you see, being a, a senior citizen, um, you know, I am very fond of reading the newspaper, and in fact, I try my level best to read at least two newspapers uh, papers every day, and I have been following this coronavirus right from December, early December. And if you remember that the retrospective investigations which were done by the Chinese government, they said that the cases of this new coronavirus, they started coming in early, early December. And I had been reading it, uh, reading it, and also uh, on the social uh, uh, media website, also checking uh, checking uh, pictures on the Wuhan animal uh, uh, market, reading all this. But I did not think, as I'm sure it must be with you also, that uh, after just three or four months, the coal crisis will have such, such uh, uh, a central place in our thinking that right now, I think all of us are not thinking about any other thing except the coronavirus. In fact, in the morning when I get up, after my little puja, which I do in the morning, the first thing I do is to check the wordometer to see how many cases have come and to look at the, at the entire thing. Now, I sometimes ask myself, why does it happen to me? Or why is it happening to me? It must be happening to you also, reading the entire newspaper, looking at the at the, at the problems of the people, looking at the crisis of the people, and also a very important aspect of stigmatization. This has already been pointed out, and, uh, and that, that uh, the stigma which the, with the, with the disease, uh, disease brings with it. Now, these are the aspects which are worth, uh, worth studying. You know, sometimes the anthropologists use the word that this is some kind of a natural laboratory, something which is, which is happening. It's a natural catastrophe. And we must, uh, we must, uh, we must study it. Look at how the whole thing has, has developed. You know, when on 11th uh, February, I think when the World Health Organization declared it as the COVID-19, 19, then we were really alarmed that what is this which is going to happen? And then there was debate or whether it is is this pandemic or, or, or not. And then of course, of course, this thing, this thing came up. So what I'm trying to say is that is 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 that that uh, the 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 aspects you know which we have uh, in our in our mind, in aspects we have in our mind, they are they actually tell us to to study 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 these and keep on on arranging our our material i know this because the study is going on the study the study is uh, is, is it has to go on simultaneously a little uh, disturbance please excuse me for that so so studying the situation 
as it is it is taking shape and i thought that i must start uh, start uh, studying uh, this particular particular phenomenon when it is actually happening some kind of an in situ study and you know today we do not only confine the idea of uh, field work to going and living with the with the people we also have the whole methodology of uh, cyber ethnography we have the methodology of uh, of uh, 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 you know uh, conducting our studies on the websites conducting a study on the facebook in fact i supervised uh, one of my students you know on uh, facebook an empirical study of, of facebook so studying all this in fact you can conduct your field work on the television you can conduct your field work on the social media sites you can conduct your uh, you know you know your field work on the newspaper so studying all this i thought that i would work on these four aspects of uh, of uh, uh, coronavirus the first i thought was it was in fact i want to bring to your kind notice that it was in fact before before the crisis became so serious that i wrote a short paper on coronavirus and globalization and i could see you know two things on one hand coronavirus may be attributed to the interconnectedness in fact if there is any term which is basic which is fundamental to to um, uh, uh, globalization is interconnected connectedness so we find that this interconnectedness of the of, of the of the societies the people migrating from one to the other moving out this has been one of the causal factors and the second aspect is equally important the trying to put an end to this sealing uh, borders not allowing uh, the outsiders to to come in so globalization and deglobalization tend to go 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 together the second topic which came to my mind was that one should study the relationship between coronavirus and and what is called intimacy and i was instantly reminded of the work of anthony giddens who wrote an excellent book on the transformation of human human intimacy so what kind of intimacy intimacy comes up in this situation and uh, and when i read about this uh, uh, this news uh, you know where a boy in sagarpur which is in southwest delhi he was uh, beaten up uh not only by law enforcing agencies but also by people because he tried to hug someone hmm? and uh, and i remember that uh, that uh, someone said that th because this boy was hugging someone near the park that is why we are beating him so how you know the bodies come to be treated in such a such a situation in fact if i am not wrong the bodies are seen with a little trepidation are seen as as some kind of a taboo category you never know who could uh, who could uh, be in your neighborhood uh, suffering from uh, the virus and you know the most problematic aspect is as as we all know that a person may be healthy but at the same time may be harboring uh, the deadly virus so because of this a kind of suspicion which come regarding the human body in fact you know once i went to the department and i was having an interaction with pc joshi who is actually my my colleague and we said that the normal human functions for example coughing for example sneezing for example uh, you know clearing the throat for example some kind of a sore throat which teachers you know usually usually suffer these things become become stigmatized so last evening when i went to the market to buy something someone sneezed and the sneeze was really very aggressive and very loud and i could see the reaction of the people people around now these kinds of constructions which come after all after all society is a construction and how these constructions come how the bodies are are treated and these bodies no more remain as uh, as one you know which um, which are are are, are um, you know respected but bodies are seen with fear bodies are seen with as 
as having less, as harboring, harboring illness. And therefore, the whole concept of uh, intimacy is uh, going, to, going to change. What effect will it have on promiscuity? What effect will it have on, uh, on other things regarding the interpersonal relationship is something which has to, be, has to be seen. I think some young students can think of working on the construction of the body in these times of, uh, of coronavirus. The third thing which came to my mind instantly was looking at, uh, at death. You know, I read quite a bit on, uh, on uh, how the cremations are taking place in Italy, hmm? how the dead bodies are being, uh, being, being treated, how many people are able to see the dead body, how the dead body is, 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 is actually, actually seen and treated. Now, this is a very important, important part. We have not, in fact, I think, we have not paid much attention to I thought that um, that one should work on what are the rights of the dead and I started looking into the material concerning this after I read certain you know gruesome report certain reports which were heart-rending from Odisha where how the dead bodies were uh, were 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 treated and and so so you know how dead dead are being treated uh, treated now you know yesterday i or day before perhaps when i read you know the news on the passing away of uh, of hari vasudevan who in fact my predecessor at the molana abdul kalam Adad institute of asian studies where he was the director later on i was the director there so I read it and his daughter says that only one of his friends will be able to see him. We will not be able to see. So how death is being constructed in this kind of a, of a situation, how the whole concept of demise is going to be looked at. And please remember that uh, these things are going to leave an indelible impression on our social construction. And the fourth thing, which came to came to my mind. The fourth thing was that how one can look at how one can look at the relationship between the individual and society in the context of uh, coronavirus. I remember, you know, a very important political scientist, George Sabine, once said that there are two two great abstractions in social sciences, the individual and, 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 and society. And the individual and society are always in a relationship of opposition. The relationship, you know, where one can use the word unity of, uh, of opposites. And they're constantly in, uh, in interaction. Now, I think there cannot be a better location to study the relationship between individual and society, then the domain of medical anthropology, where you theorize about social relations. Medical anthropology is a part of the structural relation. What do you understand, understand from this? And here, the concept of body comes up. And I will go back to where I began. Who is an individual? Now, this question often, often comes. And I'm... Uh, I'm sharing it with a little dismay that uh, many of us, while introducing the concept of individual, we do not tell us what an individual is. We do not try to break up the individual. We do not try to dissect the individual. We do not try to understand what the individual uh, is, is, is made up of. What we have in mind is that there are individual who is a unit of society, who is the basic unit of society. And we define society as a congregation of the individual. Now, this is something which is, which is, which is so common in anthropology and sociology classes. And also, the, in, the, the participant, they never ask what an individual is. And then from there, we move on to the distinction between individual and person. We move on to the to the relationship between individual person and identity and other things. 
Now let us go back to the domain of medical anthropology. If I correctly understand medical anthropology, then we are here concerned with the conceptual apparatus of uh, health, illness, sickness, the institutions which are concerned with this, or what, what Henry Segarist in 1929 called, under quote, illness behavior, or what Tweddle called illness career. Now these two concepts, illness career and illness, illness behavior. Now this is what medical anthropology is concerned. Medical anthropology is concerned with the with the individual. It is concerned with the institution. It is concerned with the dynamics of, of, of these two things. Now coming or placing yourself, you know, within the con uh, what individual, what does individual individual have? What are its its component? And see, one of the things which comes here is is what is called under quote the feeling of discomfort. Now, who has this feeling of discomfort? Who feels the feeling of discomfort? From where does it does it uh, it, it it begin? Now, this actually, and I'm not talking about the cases of uh, accident where someone is uh, is a victim of accident where others try to find out uh, or others try to say that the person is is not is not well now here coming to the individual you know the individual has number one some kind of a bio stratum some kind of a bio makeup some kind of a bio structure which we all which we all have and in fact uh, medical anthropology says it very clearly that that five propositions are basic number one that body is organic which means it is made up of things which are continuously growing and they're continuously decaying number two the second is that body is placed on a bell-shaped curve what is called the normal distribution distribution curve and this curve is both biological and this curve is also cultural when do we define old age i worked with a community in rajasthan where the old age is understood not in terms of physical feature old age is understood in terms of in terms of uh, the marriage of your children once your son is married and he brings his wife home, then you become old. And in fact, in Rajasthan, they say that at this, at this time, what you do is you hold a stick, which is the sign of, of, of old age. So there's a discrepancy between the biological definition of old age and the social cultural definition of old age. The third, the third aspect which comes here is that body is the seat of pleasure. Body is a seat of happiness. You know, you feel happiness inside. You feel pleasure, pleasure inside. Of course, it may not be so easy to verbalize it, but it's something which, which we, we all feel. But at the same time, the body is equally dirty. The body is equally full of, full of filth. In fact, uh, in fact, it may be a nauseating idea. Nevertheless, that every orifice of human body, you know, produces dirt. And here, and here, one can refer to the celebrated masterly work of Mary Douglas, who defined dirt in terms of the cultural aspect. Now, number four, this dirt has to be removed. And once again, I'm referring to, to uh, uh, Mary Douglas, that this dirt has to be, has to be removed. And there are cultural mechanisms to remove the dirt. There are cultural mechanisms to make body fragrant the cultural mechanism to, be, to make body as presentable as possible. We can use the term culture of perfume for, for this kind of a thing. And the final thing is that body performs. Body carries out, uh, carries out uh, the, the main thing. In fact, not many people have read it. And I can say with a degree of confidence that one of the best pieces, and in fact, this was, this
one of the first pieces which came up one of the best pieces written on body was in 1934 and it was done by none other than marcel moss and it was called the techniques of the body and here here he defined body as the human instrument if there is any this is what marcel moss said if there is any instrument which human beings have it is the human body and he paid such an important attention to this you know in his own study that uh, if you read it today you'll find that this is this is a very good piece to make a, a beginning after 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 marcel moss many people wrote on on body and in fact if i ever give a lecture on the anthropology of body i'll refer to all these all these work which actually have a bearing on the concept of agency body as having its own agency body as able to do do do, do the thing so so marcel moss said said that the simple things which others are able to do we are not able to do and the things which we are able to do the others are not able to do he gave this example of austin aborigin and he said that these austin aborigin they will pass through muddy roads they will pass through the forest they will squat they will squat for hours and hours together and he says marcel moss says that he has lost the ability to squat right in his childhood since his childhood he has not been able to able to squat now why why because the bodies have been trained in this matter in fact you know he gave a dichotomy of two kinds of societies one he called sitting societies and the other is called squatting societies the some people are able to squat easily and they are able to sit in a squatting posture you know publicly in public uh, you know sphere they can they can they can uh, do it but others others do not now he also worked on and it was very interesting and i am tempted to tell you he also worked on the marching styles of uh, the british forces and the french forces and he said if these british and the french forces come together you know under the same force they will have problems in their marching because they organize their bodies differently the bodies are seen seen differently and this is here that marcel moss's main idea was that body although it is made up of biostratum he did not use the word i'm using this word is made up of biostratum is is cultivated culturally therefore body becomes the confluence point the meeting point of biology which has been culturalized and culture which has been biologized you, know, you can put it put it like this how this comes up you know in fact when i used to teach medical anthropology i used to say right in the very beginning that there are not many disciplines in anthropology which actually bring physical and cultural anthropology together and medical anthropology is one of them demographic anthropology being the being the other one so in body you can find find biologization of culture in body you find the culturalization of biology coming 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 together and this in fact takes us to the first aspect the first aspect being that how body is organic because body is organic it is like you to have all kinds of of problems which uh, which 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 come up so body body is the first component of the individual now just see what is an individual let me try to define it an individual is number one divisible an individual can be conceptualized as comprising number one the culturalized biology and number two number two the biologized culture this is what the individual individual has now i do not know and i have not tried to know that what kind of a feeling of discomfort was felt by feral man 
man who was completely detached from society, one who lived alone. The story of uh, Kamala and Amla, which we all, all read, or the story of Ramu, or the study of Isabel. Now, these were the children who, in anthropological literature, came to be known as, the term, of course, has now been dropped, known as wolf children. One doesn't know that what was the feeling of discomfort or pain they had. Children who were removed from culture, children who were in their basic bio state, you know, which did not have even a modicum, even a fragment of, uh, of culture. We do not know. But when we come to the human realm, we find that, that uh, pain and discomfort which we have, the feeling that we will not be able to do the work, the feeling that uh, that uh, body is having some kind of a problem. This is cognized by the biologized culture. Now, that is what cognizes. Oh, this is the kind of uh, kind of problem which I which I I have, and then this is likely to thwart my normal activity. Like for example, for example, if suppose I am having uh, some body discomfort, I may not be able to able to teach. I may not be able to lecture. I may not be able to cycle. I may not be able to drive. Hmm? So how this kind of a feeling comes up? Now here the question is, when does the body pain become the cognized pain? Now that's the whole question. When do you take it? You know, right in the beginning of medical anthropology, we are taught that how, how illness is relatively understood. Huh? The famous example is, which I'm sure all of you, all of you know, that goiter is not understood as some kind of an illness in many of the of the mountain communities or presence of the worms. P. C. Joshi has written an excellent paper on this. The presence of worms is not considered as an ailment. Rather, it is considered as a good thing which will actually help you in digestion. That's how the people, people say, so when does the pain, the discomfort, right, you know, which, which happens in the body, when does it become a thing worthy of attention? Where we think, yes, this is something you know to which we should pay we should pay attention when does it happen now in the time sequence when it uh, when it happens now here here personally i think i think that in medical anthropological studies the method of extended case study can be of great use great use and i th think if we follow this method, extended case study method, which in fact was initially used, as we all know, and I'm adding this as a footnote, which was initially used for the study of the primitive law, the study of the, of the legal system, the legal system which was not written down. So how will you come to know how these people settle their dispute? Is to look at the disputes right from the onset right from the time the dispute begins. We start studying the dispute till the time it is settled. So this is, a, this is an entire sequence. Of course, this is longitudinal. It is time consuming. We have to spend a lot of time on, on, on this. And also, you know, it may be painfully slow process. And also, also it may bring several pangs of ennui. So of course this is likely to likely to happen. But if we study, then we'll come to know what the whole process is all about. What is the entire entire process? Now the same method, the extended case study method, the same method can be used in medical anthropology. And obviously, this would require a long field work. And I think an anthropologist worth his or her salt knows that the field studies have to be long. You have to be with the people for almost one year, sometimes more than more than one year. And in fact, as a footnote, I'll tell you, I have great respect 
and regards for the anthropologists for spending millions of hours studying people, living with them, listening to their their stories, understanding the predicaments of uh, of their life and their fortitudes of how they withstand the kind of problems which 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 come. So we, if we apply the same method, you know, we begin with the onset of the feeling of discomfort, onset of the feeling of, 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 of pain. And that is where body becomes a very important factor. In fact, for those who are interested in doing some work on body, let me, let me uh, you know, uh, uh, give the reference of Margaret Locke. Margaret Locke is a very important medical anthropologist. We all read her, her work. And in Annual Review of Anthropology in 1993, she wrote a paper on body. And where she says, right in the beginning of her paper, she says that, that uh, um, uh, body has been treated in anthropology, including anthropology, which is concerned with the study of uh, health and illness. Body has been treated as some kind of a passive category, as some kind of a, she used this word, as some kind of a black box, which is just taken for granted. We have not looked at the active involvement of the body in the same way, she says, in the same way as at one time, time was seen as a passive category. We never bothered to look at how the social structure is changing over a length of time. Unless Meyer Fortis worked on family system, on domestic system, and said that the family doesn't remain what it is. It changes over a, over a period of time. And there are different phases through which uh, it, 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 it passes. So bringing in time, in the same way, Margaret Law, and later on, Walpott, who in, I think, 2004, wrote a similar kind of paper, once again, in Annual Review of Anthropology. Both these authors have tried to say that rehabilitate body as an active agent, as an active agent, while understanding the individual understanding of the illnesses, the individual understanding of health, individual understanding of the bodily crisis. You know, so bring it, rehabilitate, body in, in, in it. Therefore, I think to be able to, to present a good perspective, if we try to break the individual as consisting of body plus something, plus something else, and then, then giving an importance to the idea, which I think is cross-culturally known, is under code, bodies speak, bodies communicate, bodies tell you. Bodies tell you what is wrong with them. And to whom are they communicating? The bodies are communicating through, through the cultural apparatus. are communicating through the telepators. And so the bodies speak. The individual listens to the body. The individual may ignore the signal of the body. The individual may not understand the actual significance of what the body is saying because that particular part may not be within the ambit of culture. Now, how to understand this particular particular concept we will understand this concept only when we problematize the body i'm once again remembering margaret law who said that body has remained unproblematized which actually means we have never you know had any discourse on this we have never had any kind of a discussion on uh, on, on this, on, on body, on the functioning of the, of the body. Now, if we rehabilitate body, the 
biology, biostratum, which is culturally interpreted. Once we rehabilitate it, then we need a concept. We need a concept for understanding this feeling of pain, this feeling of discomfort, the feeling that I will not be able to do the work, do the work with the individual knows. And again, I'm reminding you that I'm not taking into account the cases of, uh, of uh, accident, the cases of collapse, where the others are interpreting. We are looking at the individuals interpreting their own condition. So if we bring in this aspect, we need a concept for this. So I think the concept which can serve this purpose, and we'll have to look at, we'll have to look at the entire domain of medical anthropology de novo. You know, we'll have to look at the whole thing afresh and not be swayed by the kind of concept which have been there. For example, Talcott Parsons in 1951, we do with this in the, in the first year course on medical anthropology, Parsons in 1951, he popularized the term sick role. And this was his, his, his contribution to the understanding of the transition from sick role to patient role. So when the sick comes under the scrutiny of the doctor, when the sick is, is being supervised by the, by the doctor, then he becomes a patient. Now, so Parsons worked with sick role and the patient role. But what about this, this whole idea where the individual has the feeling of discomfort, where the individual has the feeling of pain, where the individual has the feeling that he or she will not be able to do, do the work. And the individual confines that feeling, feeling within itself, within himself, within herself. In fact, as a footnote, I will add that many of the people who have flu-like symptoms, right? when they have some kind of little respiratory distress or have uh, coughing, you know, intermittent uh, coughing or bouts of cough or have runny nose, all these, they, because they know that it is going to have serious consequences, they may be concealing their symptoms. And this has been stated by the media and by the state as well. That, and that is why the state has time and again said that do not conceal your symptoms. Please come forward. The whole idea of, of uh, Arogya Susetu is, uh, is, 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 is with this. Now here the individual becomes very important. The individual has the feeling of pain, but doesn't want to acknowledge it. My point is that let us have a concept of this thing. And this concept will be of great importance when we are trying to understand the passage of discomfort, making use of the extended case study method. And this concept, in my opinion, could be sickness. Let us not go by what the other definitions say. Sometimes people say illness is a serious matter, where sickness is a trivial thing, is a vague illness. You know, this is what you will read in the literature. No, not at all. We have to understand the condition. The major job of social scientists, the major job of anthropologists is to look at the concept and the concept which can help us in understanding. We have to go inside the individual. We have to look at the individual from inside, outside. So the individual has to be, has to be seen. And that is why here, you know, I said this in the other lecture also, that is why here sociology of the self plays a very important role. In fact, I will advise all the anthropologists to write articles on their, on their own understanding of their own self, looking at their own self in the same way as they look at the other society. Incidentally, this methodology of sociology of self comes in the work of M.N. Srinivas, Shiv Prashad's supervisor. And uh, Shinavas said it very clearly that you look into your own, own, own self. And, and that was the reason why Shinavas was able to write excellent papers on his upbringing in Bengaluru, his stay in Delhi School of, of, of Economics. So individual looking, a looking in, in, in himself. So for this, we can use the word, word sickness. Now, sickness may disappear on its own may have disappeared on its own because, uh, because 
to make some modifications in your lifestyle because you take a little tablet on your own without the consultation of uh, of anyone or go back to some kind of lay referral system on your own uh, on your own so you have kind of and you become become all right and you go back to the normal normal state so sickness came and it went back and the person became normal but again put it on the time sequence and some people have tried to do, they have tried to incorporate, you know, there is a model called Suchman model, Edward Suchman, who gave such a model, which actually later on was modified by Anderson and by many, 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 many other, other people. But what they do not have is an empirical study of the individual. That in the lifespan of the individual, how does it, uh, does it, does, does it go? So, so we look at uh, look at these two things. The first being uh, being the individual, and then the individual having the actor's experiences. Huh? My own experience as an actor, which sometimes in anthropology we use the word emic for this emic, which we all know has come from the word phonemic emic understanding, the actor's understanding, my own understanding. Now, when this actor's understanding is brought to the domain of the other, the domain of the other, the other may be generalized other, the other may be a specific other. Generalized other is anyone, a specific other is someone. So I have a feeling of discomfort and I, speak to my wife about it i speak to my mother about it i speak to my mother-in-law about it i speak to her, this is what is happening so that because now i want to have some kind of a cultural interpretation of the whole thing and looking for some kind of, of a cure you know we we often tend to believe in nature as the best healer now when this kind of a thing comes up when it comes to the domain of culture domain of culture with the others are commanding not only you are commanding in the first case you are commanding the domain of culture in the second one the others are commanding the domain of culture when it is interpreted then perhaps we can use the word illness and illness becomes a cultural category and you can very easily understand in this that certain kinds of uh, kinds of uh, uh, sicknesses may not be illnesses maybe a uh, a common thing. Now, here we are concerned both in the first concept and the second concept, we are concerned with what is called the lay referral system. Now we come to the domain of specialized training, the evidence based medical system, the non evidence based medical system, the other kinds of specialized systems will system come. Now, where, where the same kind of experience of pain or discomfort. This is examined using pathological indices. This is examined making use of, uh, of certain kinds of tests and, and procedures. And there you find that it is some kind of a, of a you know, uh, 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 some kind of a, of a, you know, justification, legitimacy, or whether the ailment is present or not, which comes up. It often happens. It has happened in my own, uh, own uh, life that I have pain, but the doctor says, you are absolutely fine, absolutely fine. And in fact, I wrote a short paper on this, which I never published, because sometimes sometime you should not appear before the word as fragile and as weak. And paper on a chest pain I had sometimes 19 uh, 2000 uh, 2002 I had severe chest pain and they found the, the the doctors found that I was suffering from what is called the the sinus tachycardia this is what they they found and then I had to go for a plethora of tests in fact, uh, use the word plethora, which in fact is not a very good word. I use the word plethora because 
because hundreds of these outputs were produced of uh, ECG, this and that. And the, finally, the doctor said that you don't have any, any problem. You're absolutely fine. Now, look at the discrepancy. I have chest pain. The doctor says you don't have, uh, have anything. You're absolutely fine. And so there comes the realm of placebos. You know which are are given and sometimes these placebos may work sometimes they may not may not work of course god is great and i i became all right now this is also an example of the sociology of the self about which i was i was talking now they are in that context where the etic system comes etic means as some kind of an observer's understanding hmm? understanding is based on the conduct of tests and others you know, when it comes, one can use the word disease. So you can, in case you make use of the extended case study method, you can start from the individual experience and move on, 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 on to, to, to the level of disease and the kind of cures which are, which are, which are, you know, taken care of at this, at, at this point. Now, this means, this actually means that, that we would be able to, to understand many of the things which are in fact important in the contemporary society, bringing in a new concept of the individual, which has body as a very important concept. I'm instantly reminded of a paper by Scopus microscopus, which is on anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. Now, it's, a, it's, it's an excellent study of, uh, of how body modifications lead to morbidity. Hmm? How this kind of a thing, thing. their concept of, uh, of body is that it is not only that the body is being culturally interpreted, their concept is that body is subjected to modification. We modify our bodies. Many of us dye our hair. We get our wrinkles smoothened, which is a common thing. We, we uh, use all kinds of creams to, to modify our, our body. We don't want to look, uh, look old. The second part is the disciplining bringing in discipline discipline with respect to the body hmm? every morning i have to go for walk and if i don't go then i'll feel ill although nothing is going to happen to you but you feel you feel say even you know in the time of uh, lockdown people have been uh, going out to walk because just because they couldn't resist it and they had considered this as a part of the body discipline and the third is the meaning meaning of the body, the semiotization, as it is called, semiotization of the, of, 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 of the body, the meaning which is attributed to the meaning. So the meaning which people give to, which people give to their, their bodies, to their, to the parts of their, their bodies. Now, this is something which is very important. And this will help us in understanding, understanding body modifications and the, the concomitant morbidity, which comes up, uh, comes up with this, comes up with this. So therefore, our submission is, our submission is that we will be, we will be, you know, able to, we will be able to, to, um, you know, have a new perspective on, Once in the in the time, time dimension. Now, sometimes we use the word, and it has been used again and again and again and again. What is called the ethnographic decision making. It's a whole concept which is there in medical anthropology. And here it says that how do we take a decision about uh, about about it? Which factors are responsible for, for, for this? And, and who are the others involved in it? That is why 
in contemporary medical anthropological studies, we are paying a lot of attention to what is called network analysis. How the information comes to us. Let's take an, take an example. Hmm? Now, this concept of physical and social distancing. Incidentally, I was telling uh, Dr. Sunita Reddy this morning that Anthropological Survey of India, the organization which I'm serving now, is producing a position paper on the concept of social distancing, looking at it, uh, it, it comparatively. Now, this concept has always been there. We have always been maintaining distance from other bodies. There's a concept called proximic norms. And these norms of proximity is how close you can come to the other person. I, I can give you my own example. If someone comes closer to me, I have a feeling of discomfort. Although that person is not going to be, to be transferring any contagion to me. But I, I feel it, a feeling of, uh, of uneasiness, uneasiness come. This kind of, a, this kind of a distancing has always been built, has always been built within the social structure. Huh? You must have seen this in your travel abroad, abroad that people maintain, maintain, maintain distance. Now, this concept of social distancing, and that is why we say that sometimes the discourse, discourses are created, has become important in the present context because of the contagion. How we have to keep yourself away from the, from the other. This do gas ki duri. Now this is, a, this is some kind of formula which has been a part of the social structure, but right now it has a manifest form because it is trying to provide an answer to the contemporary, contemporary situation. And this distancing should not be confused with the concept of isolation. Isolation is a different type of a, of, 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 of a thing. Now, the last thing which comes up here, and when we are practicing medical anthropology, when we are dealing with these concepts, the last concept is of is stigma which is such an important concept. And unfortunately, I find that uh, not many medical anthropologists have looked at the full value of the concept of stigma. We have an anthropological survey of India. We have tried to explore the, the nuances and the anatomy of uh, stigma in the context of uh, the studies we are carrying out, contemporarily we are carrying out on, on Denotified nomadic, nomadic communities. That how does it actually actually work? Our job as social scientists, our job as anthropologists, is to understand the working of the concept. How these concepts are actually operationalized, not to just take them, them into account. And the stigma is such an important important concept. And stigma coming from from different kinds of situations, different kinds of context, you know, the stigma which is, which is attached, attached to, 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 to them. And so, so, you know, this concept of stigma needs to be, you know, given a central place. Now, I will just come to the, the, the summary of what I have tried to, try to say in these 45 minutes I have been with you. The first thing which I have tried to submit here is, is that, that we have to understand the whole scenario of health and illness in the context of the contemporary society. That's the first thing, that we cannot miss out the things which are happening now. Just to give you an example, I thought that this is something I'll reserve it for another lecture you know the awareness of the patients hmm? awareness of the patients about the about the illnesses now this is an amazing thing the moment you come to know what it is you go to the google resources huh? and you read uh, read so much about it that you know about it huh? you know just to give you an autobiographical example you know my grandson you know he had some stomach uh, little stomach ailment hmm? And he wrote a three-page note 
on what his illness is and also providing an interpretation of this. And we went to the doctor and he read out the entire thing before the doctor that this is what he's having. Now, how does he, he have this? Because he is, is aware. He's aware of, of the, the, the resources. And obviously, this is going to provide some kind of a disequilibrium to the relationship between the patient and the doctor. Now, this is a very important thing. And that's why what the doctors do is, and they're likely to do is, that they will become more and more technical. They will talk more and more in the technical language, as the astrologers do. Now, if you ask an astrologer today, first of all, the astrologer will speak in a language which you will not understand. Okay, just because the astrologer wants to tell you that he knows more than what you know. In the same way, the doctor will try to know more than, will try to tell you to know more than that. And, and it's quite likely that the doctors may say, may say, do not go to the Google resources. They are unreliable. So the context in which we are, we are living, the availability of the knowledge, the rights of the patients. Now, this is another area which needs to be studied the rights of the patient, the, the facilities which are available, the patient care which is available. So, so we have to take into account all these things which are happening, keeping in mind that there are differences. Rural scenarios are different from urban scenarios. Gender scenarios are different. Age scenarios are different. One of the lessons we have learned as anthropologists is society is not homogeneous. Rather, it is divided within and it has contesting perspectives on and about reality. The second thing which I've tried to say is that critically examine the concept of the individual and bring in the concept of body in it. The third thing I have tried to tell you is to bring in the time dimension and look at how the, the discomfort proceeds and when it becomes chronic or it leads to the, to the demise. So look at the time dimension. The fourth thing I have tried to say is that look at the contemporary scenario, whether it is the COVID-19 or, or it is, say, for example, the case of... Uh, uh, anorexia nervosa or Bolivia nervosa, you know, in there, the kind of cultural artifacts, let me use this word, which are produced in this time. For example, you know, in anorexia nervosa, the concept of thin inspiration was, uh, was very common, thin plus inspiration, that if you're thin, this is some kind of an in inspiration, although you may be, be, may be having a large number of uh, morbid illnesses. So the kind of culture which is created, one cannot be away from the cultural aspects. I think I will stop here. And if there are questions, please ask me as many as you want to want to ask me. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks. It was pleasure listening to you and more than 100 participants joined. And all of them have thanked you for such a wonderful lecture. And uh, in fact, uh, the participants have come from uh, many colleges within India, uh, especially from Orissa, Assam, West Bengal, uh, Delhi University, of course, and Anthropological Survey of India. And there are a few others who have joined from other countries also, from Hong Kong and USA. And many of them are your students, ex-students, and I, some of your colleagues. So I'm really glad to have all of them here. There are a couple of questions. I'll just read them out, sir, and then maybe we can take 10, 15 minutes time mm. to yeah. answer yes. them. Yes. I'll just read out. Um, so uh, this uh, one question is about uh, uh, body is organic, as you said, but it's not only organic. According to traditional concept, it is said that our body is made of five inorganic elements like fire, water, etc. What can we say about that? Then uh, there's another question on uh, uh, cognition of symptoms that makes one realize and recognize the illness. Uh, there's another uh, question. How can we study isolation and social distancing as a new way of staying healthy in light of COVID-19? 
and also this virus has introduced new dimension to meaning of cleanliness purity and hygiene how can we approach to study the same and there's one more last question which is uh, uh, how do we help people who conceal or are in the state of denial of their sickness for our own precautions or being protected from an infectious disease um, so there are one or two well, questions. I, I, I may not remember all of them. Sure. But first of all, I'd like to thank yeah. uh, my very dear friends, Professor Sukant Kumar Chaudhary, Professor yes. Shiv Prashad, uh, um, and also Professor P.C. Joshi. I can They're see all them here. Yes. yes, yes. I'm really grateful that they could take some time you know, from their very, very busy schedule to, to, to listen to me. Now, coming to the first aspect about uh, body, what is body uh, body made up of? Huh? Now, these things that five inorganic material and organic material, now these are different conceptions of uh, the, the body. Now, I, as an anthropologist, would say that rather than starting from any kind of a preconception of body, that this is what Ayurveda says, or this is what the Yunani system says. When we are conducting our own field studies, let us understand from the people what is their conception of body. What is body for, for, for them? How do they define the, the body? You know, the problem which comes up when we go with the preconceived ideas is that we have all these ideas written down, and then we start asking, do you have this? Do you have this? And people may not have. That is why we say that our entire work has to be with a tabula rasa perspective. Let us ask from people what kind of a conception you, you have. When I said the body is organic, I was looking at the anthropological, anthropological writing. I was looking at the, the ethnographic accounts. Actually, if there is anything which could be called the flesh of anthropology. If there's anything, it is the ethnographic account. In fact, I advise the students to read as many ethnographies as possible because they come to know that how human diversity is presenting, uh, presenting itself. So we will rather take up a relativistic view of, of this. Now, then there was another question which I remember. I'm, I'm not remembering them uh, 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 sequence wise. This was about social distancing and isolation. I think I referred to this in my, in, my, in my lecture. Now, social distancing actually means observing a reasonable, reasonable difference from distance from the other individual. This is what, what it means. Now, why? Why? Because the other individual may be infected or we may be infected. We may transfer the, the deadly virus, uh, virus to them. Okay. So in this, it is better to keep some kind of distance. Even otherwise, even otherwise, you see, if you look, if you survey, and my friends are there and they will, they will support me on this. If you look at, uh, at the survey of the norms, the kind of norms we have, proximic norms are an important one. The distance we have to observe. Now, isolation would mean there's some kind that you are totally, totally cut off. Now, when we are observing social distance, distancing, it is not isolation. It is some kind of a, let me put it like this, is some kind of a conscious, conscientious effort, effort to keep in mind that that the anthronotic aspect of the ailment being transferred from one human being to the other human being, this can be dangerous and therefore it is better to observe some type of a, some type of a distance from the, from the other. Now, you know, uh, today we are realizing the importance of that, for example, namaste, rather than shaking hand. You know, once I suffered, and I was in Lucknow, Sukhan Chaudhary knows this, I suffered from acute amoebiosis. And Sukhan Chaudhary took me to a doctor. And I still remember, he will tell me, that the doctor said, look, uh, you know, these amoebas, you know, they, they live in your, in your uh, nails. So you should cut your nails and try not to shake hands with others. 
because you may be free from amoeba, but some other person may have it. Yeah? And so it will come. In other words, these kinds of precautions had to be had to be uh, kept in kept in mind. This would apply to apply to to many things. For example, example talking to the other person. Many people, you know, many people have foul smell. Hmm? Many people. I don't want to name them. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do you regulate your relationship with them? This is some kind of a social distancing. Social distancing is 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 not shunning social distancing is doing something very respectfully because when i am distancing from you i am also telling that i may be harboring the infection you understand and this infection may not be just covid 19 it can be any other kind of invasion in, in, infection swine flu applies uh, has the same thing uh, 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 the common uh, cold has the same thing okay common cold also also spread so this is where we can make a, a distinction isolation becomes a very negative thing in my opinion social distancing becomes a positive thing and other questions i have forgotten just to remind me uh, i'll ask you more questions sir but uh, professor shiv prasad sir has a question i yes. think sir, you can ask directly yes yes, yes I, it's, a, it's a very interesting idea that you talked about uh, the biologizing uh, culture and culturalizing biology and uh, this has implications because uh, cultures are diverse when cultures are diverse uh, their uh, uh, understanding of uh, health itself is also so diverse because they vary according to the food habits uh, the body resistance and uh, some the, vi the viruses or the diseases uh, you know, take on very quickly, some on others it doesn't. So can we look at, because when culture has a kind of an understanding of uh, one's body, which is again diverse, can we think that it will have implications in terms of uh, theorizing uh, and generally, because now we can see why some people they roam around, they carry, but they don't get affected. But some people, even if they are affected, they will recover. Because we saw in Spain, one lady who is 113 years old, mm -hmm. she recovered from uh, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And in other words, there are variations in terms of, because the body is, again, uh, has variations in that. So now, do we think that uh, in some countries where this is not so much uh, virulent in some other countries, it is really uh, serious because they're because of cultural and other variations. I just wanted to ask you on that. Uh, yes, there are actually uh, two questions you have asked. The first question is about the cultural diversity. That, uh, that if one culture is different from the other culture, one can easily surmise that their conception of the bodies will also be, also yeah. be different because uh, each because each culture has its own cognition and right. each culture is historically rooted and culture also happens to be resilient right. okay so there'll be different kinds of so how will you be able to theorize and there's a whole question which comes up and this is this is a big question this is a huge question because this question has always bothered the anthropologists that if there are if there are large number of societies, what is uh, common to all of them and how to find what is common to all of them. I remember when the People of India project was done and they found that the India has 4,635 communities, the main question was one is different from the other. But where is the Indian nest in it? Where is the soul of the Indian culture in it? And this can be done. <clears throat> This can be done either by resorting to some kind of a comparative method. After all, you know it, Shipashaji, that yeah. George Peter Murdoch started yeah. this kind of an exercise, finding finding what are the nomothetic things you know, yeah. from a statistical variation to nomothetic thing. And that can be done by comparison. My my submission is that uh, that uh, <clears throat> we should not miss out the the efficacy of the method of comparison. Right, mm -hmm. right. Surely we know the society we have studied very well. We know it because we have spent a long time time with that. Huh? 
and we have a fair understanding of that uh, their society but at the same time we should always keep on comparison yeah. although comparison is inbuilt in the anthropological world because i don't think there can ever be an anthropologist who is not comparative because when you are under, under, undertaking your study you are continuously comparing it with what you have read about the other cultures and other other societies okay so this is number one comparative method perhaps will be able to answer now you know what has happened in anthropology not only in anthropology but other disciplines also that we are a little frightful of undertaking comparison we want to be as microcosmic as possible eh? so we can hide behind the microcosm hmm? so when it comes to the macro sociological thing you know then we feel uh, feel a uh, uh, little little concerned and we we th- say we are methodologically not properly equipped and so we give it up the second thing which comes up is the variation with respect to with respect to the country and how they have responded to to coronavirus now this is something which one has to take up for example the genetic factors yes the genetic factors in this you know this question has been coming up but not being taken so seriously as it should be taken for example is there any kind of a epigenetic or genetic resistance yes huh someone yes. talked that indians are very prone to cardiac ailment because they have certain kinds of a genetic structure so mm-hmm. is is the geneticist should also do the work do the work with respect to the 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 genomic constitution and yes. how these genomic constitutions could be different from the from the other the third thing is you know prashad ji i personally feel that uh, that uh, um the individuals do not actually do not actually take the commands the direction seriously this is what i want to say i want to say this is in the context of the lockdown you know when i know that i am 67 years old you are younger to me and i know that this is my my age and i also know that i am in the vulnerable category and i know that this is the only way by which you can you can avoid it has been established after the virus was isolated sometimes in early january yes early yes. january the virus i think 9th january or so it was isolated yes. and the the covid 19 cluster was found on 31st december 9 2019 once i know that this is man to man transmission okay and people who are already vulnerable because of being hypertensive because of diabetes because of renal problem because of this so i have to take care care of the self yes. now what i find and what disturbs me and what is grossly missing is that people think <coughs> that nothing will happen to them you know that's true Hmm. Smriti ji, yes, I, I, do, I have a question. Huh? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, please ask. Huh, sir. But don't ask a difficult question. No, no, no. This is not, it's not a question. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I just enjoyed the lecture for a long time. I, I want to hear from Joshi sir also. Ha ha ha. Joshi sir, will say. Uh, i just enjoyed i mean all of us enjoyed the lecture as usual wonderful five points very nicely explained initially i missed uh, one or two points but you in the end you explained what i had to say uh, kindly uh, throw some light on stigma uh, are you able to hear sir mm-hmm. of course of course uh, stigma of course. because uh, uh, probably goffman had said once i mean uh, it is often quoted in a uh, such kind of sickness medical rules and all that those who are seen outside the realm of the normality hmm. are stigmatized mm-hmm. those who are seen outside the uh, realm of sphere of uh, normality or normality hmm. they are all stigmatized hmm. does it go along well with this uh, case of uh, stigma 
and what hmm. kind of stigma we are already we have already seen from the uh, newspapers and electronic media people are stigmatized the um, covid uh, those who are fighting the doctor the police uh, officers and uh, nurses they are getting stigmatized and those who are coming back also are getting stigmatized does that government's uh, generalization go along well with uh, this kind of, of stigma look um, this is one thing it's a very good question you have asked actually government was not actually concerned with the degrees of stigma my major my major submission here has been that he was the one in his book called stigma what he did was he drew our attention to the existence of what he called under court dishonored label and this honored label is put on those who are who are different from the others a stigma is used generally in the negative sense so people who are not having the normal thing they may be victims of stigma but stigma is on a continuum now suppose someone suffers from psoriasis okay a skin ailment hmm? the others may feel a little concerned coming closer to him and so they may may, may be away now this is how it works i sometimes give this example in my classes that a large number of the beggars on uh, okhla road those who are seeking arms they are suffering from leprosy and many of them are to use this word are bacteriologically free they're not having any bacterial infection but see how people how people behave towards them suppose they have to toss a coin huh eh, in their you know arms bowl they will throw it won't even look at them so how stigma actually works in the in the situation the degrees of stigma okay uh vinay sir are you listening to me now uh i am actually going to lose uh, power Hello? very soon so <laughs> Professor P. C. Joshi yeah, so, is speaking. Yeah. So, ah, yes, so yes. I asked. I'm, I'm yes. Dr. Joshi. So I think uh, you have uh, given a very good lecture, and uh, and I think you have uh, uh, brought out the importance of anthropology of body. And I think uh, this is the time when when people are you know like uh, where the concept like social body and body politics are are very much you know uh, in the open. due to corona scare and uh, you know and there is this uh, this fear that is going on and uh, how this uh, you know prolonged isolation that people are experiencing of course digitally people are coming close but social isolation physical isolation that people are facing people are in the rooms <coughs> what kind of uh, mental health impacts this is going to have i think we we can only imagine and uh, they are going to be to my mind long term impacts long term impacts as far as uh, anxiety disorders are concerned or maybe some kind of depressions are concerned to people because uh, they are uh, you know they are sometimes getting unnecessary scared as well you know i tell you you have one person having corona in a building the whole building is sealed 1000 people are asked not to go there you know rather than isolating people who are or you know testing people who are having positive and then isolating them we are isolating people in bulk because for us we do not have the facility of testing people or you know confirming uh, whether they are suffering from corona so this kind of fear that is there you know the social fear i remember reading a book called the anthropology of fear so what i am saying that in coming days anthropology of fear and how fear affects the society how fear affects the culture how fear affects the habits and behavior i think are going to be very very important uh, uh, future uh, questions to us i don't know exactly what question but there will be many questions on anthropology of fear that we are going to see well joshi sahab you have um, raised uh, several points and i'll try to answer as briefly as as possible the first is about uh, what are the 
latent happenings of um, of social distancing and the lockdown obviously if you read the newspapers i do not uh, have any access to any study but we have uh, enough material in the newspapers which say that how people are becoming alcoholic domestic violence and domestic abuse is on is on increase we also know about uh, depression which is coming which which is common we also know that how people are becoming couch potatoes huh? watching one film after the other film in fact some of my my colleagues are already thinking of conducting a study on what people are doing in the vicinity of their houses during the lockdown what are they doing huh? um well you and me are different because because in my case in fact after lockdown my work has multiplied several times now the files come to me on uh, as as email earlier you know the my officer will explain to me what is it all about eh? now i have to read it i have to read it and then only i can i can say anything but what about the common people how they are being affected by this and some studies are needed on this that what are the negative aspects of of this number 2 about fear no like the concept of time like the concept of body the concept of fear has also been has also not been properly studied fear you know which is institutionalized enough there can be one kind of fear which is highly personal and may emerge from my mental state for example in a closed room which is dark right and something moves and i start shouting ghost ghost but institutionalized fear when the fear is built up in the in 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 the system you gave the example that one person is found to be positive the entire building is sealed right obviously that person that person who may be having symptoms okay would not like to announce it because that person knows that once he announces so so this the fear which is which is built up and in fact we have to do a lot of work on this fear is not only with respect to this fear comes when you go for uh, for pathological investigation now suppose you send your urine sample for culture culture results will come in 72 hours what will be your state of affairs in 72 hours you do not know what will happen you may get something very serious huh? so that kind of fear which is all 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 built up uh, uh, in, in in this and therefore therefore we have to address in our study in the studies which we which we are intending to carry out on on uh, 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 coronavirus and other kinds of illnesses it is important that we bring in the aspect of fear and how to very important how to mitigate it we need approaches some kind of real social welfare work approaches to mitigate stigma now this is one great problem and i have been addressing this in my own the survey of india's work on denotified communities that how to mitigate this stigma when someone looks at a nomadic community and says that they are child you know stealers that they will take away the children so how to fight these kinds of conceptions and this is an aspect which needs to be needs to be addressed it is not just meant you know to be spoken about in seminars but really we have to do something something about about it the fear the fear with respect to anything yeah? and that would come with a proper kind of kind of counseling actually you see you know i refer to marcel moss and marcel moss in his essay i am very fond of this essay and you know it that i have often quoted it the techniques of the body now he actually gives a lot of importance to socialization the way we are brought up 
So if at the level of socialization, Moss is arguing, if at the level of socialization, we try to combat these kinds of things, we would be able to create a different kind of a generation. So the, the yep, you know, we say charity begins at home. If you start with the process of, uh, of socialization, why bodies are, are different? Hmm? Why in some, some societies, uh, beauty magic is regarded as more important? Because the way people are, 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 are socialized. You know, the, the kind of precepts which are given, for example, for example, we are told that while you are eating, do not drink water with your food. Yeah? Drink water after you have eaten your food at least one hour. Even if you may be having, uh, having uh, uh, you know, feeling very thirsty, but this is, uh, this is, is some kind of norm. And we internalize, uh, internalize that, uh, that norm. In the same way, all these things have to be internalized. In fact, Goffman said, Goffman said that a stigma has to be fought. A stigma has to be combated. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. There are a few more questions. I'm afraid mm -hmm. we won't be able to take. Uh, shall we uh, continue for five, ten minutes more? If Absolutely. Okay. There is no problem. Continue you. even for two hours, three hours. <laughs> I know that sir. you can continue, but I'm sure uh, there are so many questions which needs to be no, addressed. No, and definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely so there's no one question. Yes. Uh, huh. How the cultural concept of body influences the medical diagnosis across cultures and medical systems? Are there any studies on this? So we have few public health well, scholars also. That's the reason. Yes. Well, well, I personally think that today now the doctors are becoming more and more sensitive to the cultural aspects of illness. You know, there's a category which even the public health specialists know. There's a category of what is called culture bound syndromes. And this is a very important category. Huh? Just to give you an example. I am living with my wife and my child. Okay, 